we do feel immensely pleased that um, the Honourable Paul Keating, the former Treasurer and Prime Minister of this country, has agreed to launch this book. It's not just because it's about him. Um, I know that Mr Keating gets asked to launch many books and he usually says no, uh, for very good reasons, because they're not published by us. Uh, but uh, this is a book about uh, an era in Australian public life which turned out to be tremendously important, but it was also an era that was thwarted to some extent by what happened in 1996. And um, the subject um, of, of that era and its significance is, is dealt with in this book by David Love. And I'd like to welcome Paul Keating to launch Unfinished Business. Thank you. Well, thank you indeed, Henry and David. Ladies and gentlemen, well, this was a book a long time in the making. <laughs> in fact, I never thought it would ever be made. And it turned out, after I'd read read it only recently that David had actually interviewed me in 1996, the year that uh, I lost the, uh, with the Labor Party the general election. When I saw the uh, manuscript, uh, well the first print, the first uh, pull if you like of the uh, book, uh, as I read through it I could see the um, threads uh, that David had picked up all the way through but in the meantime, we'd had the 97-98 Asian financial crisis. Uh, we'd seen um, uh, some substantial changes in the economy. Uh, we'd seen a long period of growth. Of course, we'd seen uh, in superannuation, which he mentions here solidly. We'd seen the superannuation guarantee charge come up to finish at 9% by 2001. By 2007, David would have seen the numbers tick over as we'd crossed the trillion dollars in super. That was not there in 1996. So lots of things changed in the, in the 10 years between 1996 and 2007, 11 years. It, it, it gives, it's a very interesting snapshot. But these are some of the reasons why it is a very important book. Now, not all books are important. And not all books about me are important. Uh, I can tell you that. And, uh, and it may be true, and certainly is in this case, that a smaller book has done a better job of working out what I was about than perhaps a more voluminous book might have done, if you know what I mean. So, uh, and the other reason the book is important and probably the principal reason the book is important. It's written by a commentator from the age of hopelessness. This is when we were in the age of incrementalism, the days when, when there was no changes in economic policy, the place was run by the mandarins, uh, and things just shifted without any political authority, they could only therefore shift incrementally. And I mentioned in one of the interviews, uh, Fred Wheeler and Arthur Tang and these people meeting at the Commonwealth Club on a Friday evening to work out, you know, in a sense, you show me your little incremental change and I'll show you mine. You know, that's what it really boiled down to. And so, uh, at the time when the terms of trade really turned sour for Australia, they since turned wonderfully well, but when they turned sour in their long secular decline, was about the time Menzies retired in 1965. That's when the structural changes should have really been taking place. In fact, they didn't take place till Bob Hawke and I and that government turned up nearly 20 years later. Uh, but at that stage, David would have been in his 30s at the time of Menzies' retirement. He would have been in his prime. And of course he, he put together this, later in his life, uh, this uh, influential uh, commentary paper called Syntec. And if you were anyone in corporate Australia through the 1970s and into the 1980s, then you would have found that Syntec was the only authoritative outside of the commentary you get in the Financial Review in terms of 
you know, things like swaps and prices on the forward exchange markets and things like that. Syntec was really the only paper that covered them. And so David, David uh, with his, uh, his friend Alan Wood, uh, who was his partner in the business, David principally was the commentator from the age of incrementalism, from the age of hopelessness. And that's why this book is important because it, it, it takes you through the way things were, the completely hopeless state in the way things were uh, in economic policy and, uh, and to what it is today. Now, younger journalists have written and written competently about the period. Paul Kelly just walked in and there's this great text, The Age of Certainty. And these are very informative works and important parts of the history. But David's work today has got a, a, a wholly different slant. It, it is, it is, he was a young man when the terms of trade started to slide, when the structural joy for Australia started to end in the middle 60s. And he's gone on to talk about, to talk about the changes since. Now, uh, I remember well when the Reserve Bank was just a bond selling agent of the Treasury. You know, the Treasury determined monetary policy, it wasn't the Reserve Bank. And even though the Reserve Bank had a prudential role in supervising banks and issuing the currency and all the rest, in policy terms, it was a completely subordinate organisation to the Treasury and to uh, and to the official family, and of course the exchange rate was set not on a quantity basis but on a price basis. And of course in those days if you set it, if the central bank buys all the foreign exchange, the central bank has to issue all the local currency to the domestic money market, the domestic money supply, and of course that used to pump along the money base and with it inflation. So <clears throat> he talks about, he starts out, calls the ancien regime, you know, what it was like in the old days. And he, in the book, some might say this is a product of his age. He talks about Everett and the split. And you'd say, well, who would today be talking about Everett and the split? But if you want to talk about me in those days, Everett and the split is important. Because, you see, and he says, if I'd have been, if my family had been a Victorian family, we may well have been in the DLP. Well, I'd like to think we wouldn't have, David, but I mean, <laughs> I mean, you've got to draw the line somewhere. But I mean, uh, even if you had to put up with Bill Hartley and that, those other maniacs that ran the show. But the, other, the, point, the point that has to be understood is, though, that is, after the first great period of growth in the 20th century, 1904 to 1929, from 1929 to 1947, there was no growth. 1929 to 1947. Apart from the Second World War, there was no growth based on private investment. And that's a generally true statement about the Western world. And so therefore, when we get back to some sort of period of peace after the Second World War, is that, was there any wonder there was a, there was a contest of ideas about whether centrally planned economies uh, with egalitarian concepts were superior than robber baron economies of the kind which had brought the 1929 collapse on. And so there was no settlement of these issues. You know, half the Labor Party believed in, in central planning and they still believed into it really until, until I turned up. And probably today some still believe in it. I mean, there are fossils still out there. Uh, and, and the fact is that... Uh, that uh, so you go into the 1950s, uh, which is the period I grew up in, uh, uh, not politically, but as a kid, uh, then there was no settlement of these issues. And in the 60s, not either, because the 60s party, which was a contest between Corwell and Whitlam in the Labor Party, Goff had no real interest in economic matters and uh, 
Corwell and Co. Uh, understood you needed a private economy. They, they, they didn't think the party had any ability to run a centrally planned economy, but that's about as far as it went. And of course, after the split, after Everett, the Victorian Labor Party believed in central planning, etc. The New South Wales Labor Party didn't. Uh, and there was a great contest for ideas. So to write about those things in the book is important. You know, you get, to, you get an idea of where I'm coming from in this, in this show. Um, David has, uh, has gone to, 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 to lengths to try and tell the story of what influenced my thinking about why the old Australian defence model, uh, which was you know, high terms of trade, uh, paying for high levels of protection afforded by arbitrarily set wages, uh, why we went around on that triangle for all those years until, of course, the first leg of the triangle broke down. And in it, in it of course, he, he lifts the lid on the sort of the silent conspiracy. He says, that he talks about, uh, the, I'll, I'll, I'll quote him, the subjugation of Australian households to meet the needs of an established combination. The export industries, the overly protected, tariff protected manufacturing industries and the overly protected unions. So you had this, all these influences had a chop at the cherry. The people that didn't get a chop at the cherry were ordinary working people. And he says the essence of his mission, meaning mine, in those first six years as treasurer was to ease this ancient burden on ordinary working class and middle income families, households. Uh, and he gives an instance like narrowing the domestic bank margins on housing, he says, represented a major transfer of income from banks to households. And you can see also on the tariffs. And he talks about the levels of tariff protections which obtained at the time, you know. When I became treasurer, the effective rate of protection on a car was 96%. And now it's about four. So a Hyundai, a Hyundai gets, you can get out there now for $16,000 or 17, would have been 30,000 so, or more, and ditto for all the other cars, which meant that Australian working people, their standard of living was going down while they were paying these inordinately high prices for protection of the motor vehicle industry uh, and, of course, the, uh, the protection of, um, uh, of uh, all sorts of industries and, of course, most especially the, f the banking industry, which had the, biggest, uh, which had the biggest scam of all running. Uh, but we always had this, these groups uh, and, you know, people like Menzies and others were smart enough to keep, the, keep that ball in play so they'd pick up a few people out of the labour movement they liked if you were safe and decent, you know, weren't a pedophile or something, you might be appointed a vice president of the Arbitration Commission. Might, might, you know. And, and that was your place in the sun, you know. Uh, and, and so there was this thing, but the great mass of the people, of course, were completely robbed in this period. And of course, on the company side, those great men of business, 